you're targeting them. It, it's, if you say in your head, like, this isn't cold, this is a very warm lead to me because I've done my research. I know what they want. I'm reading what they want. I can see their company's, um, their company numbers and their company goal is to expand their B2B business this year and I can help them. Therefore, alter everything to be specific to that um, prospect. So I find myself most successful when I have the, the information and I just word that correctly. Awesome, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of It Is What It Is is podcast i'm talking about the best podcast i like to coin it as business tame it not left that's my left hand not right <laughs> as i've seen it on screen it looks backwards just like this is an amazing episode with an amazing leader but we're going to come down to the nitty-gritty about sales and just kind of where it's going and the nuances and in the international landscape and i'm so excited to have this guest on today but you know what you got to do if you want to keep seeing amazing leaders amazing content there's a few things you got to do y'all help brother out you got to subscribe to the youtube page like share comment subscribe youtube at cv space k that's cody vernon space k that's kelly so if you know what it means also where the best supplements are www.cvnkglobal.store i have with me right now superpowers one of the hottest pre-workouts on the market we have the vegan proteins bcaas all the good stuff Go to www.cvmkglobal.store, Instagram at cvmk33, Instagram also on the business page, cvmk underscore global, as you're seeing a reoccurring theme, TikTok, cvmk global, no underscore, connect with me there. We look forward to hearing from you. And with that being said, I want to introduce this guest. Now, I have to give shout out to my boy, Travis. Uh, you know, I want to, you know, give him his props. That man is doing amazing things. Uh, real friend, just amazing leader in the space. I had this guest on. I was like, I got to reach out. I really think she's changing the landscape of sales. And with that being said, I want to introduce you to Shannon Montrose. Shannon, how are you doing today? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me, Cody. It's been a long time coming. <laughs> true enough. True enough. So Shannon, just for the audience's sake, if you could just give a little brief you know, bio of who you are and what you do, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, so I work in the tech industry. I'm currently an SDR slash BDR in a very well put together business intelligence company. And I'm trying to, yeah, get people interested in being an SDR and showing them the the easiness of doing it and the funness and just an exciting place to work, I reckon. So that's a bit about me. Cool, cool. So first, first question, you know, we talk about SDR, sales development reps, right? We talk about trying to create this um, atmosphere that draws talent, yeah. right? But you hear all the terrible stuff, you know, I, I work in sales and, you know, so I know, <laughs> I know the full answer, you know, but, but why, why have you, and I'm always interested and I always start out every interview with why, why did you go into sales i feel like a lot of people may say this it was an accident i got into sales accidentally um i was doing like an internship when i was 16 just turning 17 for um another tech company and you know i started there a year doing like business admin it wasn't really that it was full-on client success account management so that's what got me into sales what made me stay in sales was the knowledge you got from speaking to people like that was my that was my university days basically just taking on all of the knowledge from the c-level people i was speaking with and then another good factor was the money (laughs) it was good it was attractive it kept you on your feet a lot and yeah i'm quite a resilient character and you you need that in sales and it it made me stay there so i've not looked back since that that is uh interesting. I I will say for myself, I think true sales professionals get into it by mistake. I don't think anybody wakes up and be like, you know, I think I want to sell something today. Yeah. You know, like it's a uh, for whatever reason things align and you find yourself in this company and it's like, how the heck did I get there? But the cool yeah. thing is, yeah, if you're resilient and you kind of have the talent and I won't say the makeup but the drive, 
yeah. right? To want to be successful, you start realizing like I can survive in this climate. Um, and it just kind of happens that way. Look, I look forward. We're going to have some amazing questions lined up, but we got to take a word from our sponsors. There's a hero in all of us waiting to be unleashed. All it takes is just that one last push. Activate the hero within with CBMK Global Supplements. All natural, steroid free, designed to enhance performance, build muscle, and increase energy. You are unstoppable. You can do this. Become your own hero at www.cbmkglobal.store. Awesome, man. We're back. Y'all go to www.cbmkglobal.store. Look how cool it is. That could be you. Be your own hero. Unlock the potential within. And so, you know, there are interesting evolutions i think that is happening uh within business as a whole um one of the cool things is the world is getting smaller with the advent of technology um you know all of a sudden it doesn't matter where you live you know you could be interacting with somebody in the uk like yourself right or you know you could go national international tell me about before we get into kind of the organizational cultures and shiftings what is the international landscape for sales reps? And, you know, and then I'll kind of throw in kind of how this U.S. and see if there's some synergy there. Yeah. So we are like we we have all territories, basically. So we are kind of pushed to sell to U.S. Is that kind of the question you're asking? Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah so the U.S., the, there's a lot of money in tech and that's where that's where the buyers are. It's a lot of time if it's a U.S. company and they've got U.K. divisions, the decision makers always in the U.S. So we are promoted or pushed to target U.S. Um, England as well, like, of course, you, you want to start there. You want you to, to build your name in, in your country first and foremost, test the product, get co- product feedback. But the way we operate is... Because timing difference, slightly different. Sometimes I might work US hours. So that'd be like 11 p.m. Um, to 11 a.m., sorry, to 8 p.m., 9 p.m. Mm-hmm. As long as you are able to adapt, like especially in the UK, you can still be successful internationally, um, which we've, we've seen much success. We go to networking events in the US. And so we've just come back from three in Balancaster and uh, Dreamforce. And the way we operate over there is the exact same, just different um, internationally, basically. So there's, I don't see a big issue kind of selling internationally as well. It's very straightforward as it would be to the UK. Um, other territories, slightly different, actually, like um, Japan, Australia. It's always time difference. Um, it's Asia, sorry, cash is quite small there, but it's a bit of time difference um you know being able to call at the right time and uh then set up a follow-up meeting for the correct timing that's where the a bit of trickiness comes but with the market that's most attractive to us right now we're coping it's, it's working well i think we may need to adjust slightly with you know our working hours and what we can commit to but that's for like cold calling days we'll we'll stay later because we want to get everyone so as long as uh, yeah, you're you're able to commit to that, it's a, it's a good place to start. That makes a lot of sense. I think for us, it's crazy. You mentioned that uh, that's where all the buyers are, and I know I agree with you, uh, sixty seventy percent. Yeah, I think America has this. Uh, not veil, but this kind of uh, guys that you know all the decisions, all the power decisions are made here. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, or traditionally so, right? Um, what I'm learning <laughs> is that you know what's crazy is, especially as a company evolves and it expands, yeah, a lot of your decision makers uh, things are very siloed. So there might just be a U.S you know, branch, it'd be the same company, but they kind of handle all the operations and two different, you know, PLMs, uh, profit and loss statements, and some technology also varies. But as business expands, there's this push really into this international space because the U.S. is no longer the voice of truth. Yeah. 
You know, and I think that's fair. And I don't, I don't matter, you know, I'm an American. I'm a proud of it. It's not like you're saying, oh, yeah, no. So don't, if you take this like, what do you mean? It's not the voice. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the U.S. is not the only, you know, horse in the race. There are other economies that are just as developed, if not more. Japan mm. being one of them, China being a huge one, United Kingdom, you know, being really on par, I would say, with the U.S. as a whole. And then when you get outside the United Kingdom, you know, Germany, you know, like, hey, people sleep on Germany. Like, Germany is like this powerhouse. You know, and and when you start realizing that you're right, tackling business on a global landscape is a real thing. I have to sometimes get up super early because, you know, you guys are seven hours ahead and like my meetings will be like six, five in the morning and it'll be like one, two p.m. over there. And I'm just like, oh, my gosh, I'm still asleep. Caffeine has hit the system. You know, I still got the frog in the voice. And, you know, it's so interesting learning that, wow, how similar we are which I think is needed. Um, And then, wow, how different expectations are. And what I, and I, and I mean by that, like I would say, and this is just me, Mm. international businesses are more inclusive. Yeah. Would you agree with that? A hundred percent. They are. Some are difficult to sell to because if you've chosen them, like if they get a cold call, like hell no, it's like absolutely not. But if they have a vendor that they're interested in, they will pursue that vendor. So a lot of the time, if you're introducing a new product to them, they already know about the space and they've decided whether they wanted to purchase already or or not. And most likely reviewed all vendors. So like Asia is super difficult. They are very close knitted and they've got security and loads of like security and legal and, kind of what you can do and what you can see with their data. And a lot of these tech companies, you know, they integrate with their systems and their Gmail and their Salesforce or HubSpot. And that's where, like, I find a lot of blocking is kind of legal requirements and the security side of things. So I find that a lot in the US, Germany, very much so, and, um, yeah, Asia. No, I agree. I think the, the legal requirements is like you need an NDA just to even start the conversation. It's like, man, we haven't even did a proper discovery call. You signed this before we did, you know, but it's it's so true. What do, what do you, because I, I, I want to take it before we start getting into the sales methodology, right? I really want to talk about the personal experience then leading into sales methodology because there's still this, and I hate to say it, but I'm going to just say it. <laughs> there's still this glass ceiling, you know, mm. as a rep, you know, sometimes I always joke and said, man, I like dealing with companies that really have diversity. And then I like dealing with international companies because when I call them, when I meet with them, there isn't a shock, like, <gasps> you know, like, and, and cause I've, I've been on it. I've been on the zoo calls and it's like, you can tell if somebody's comfortable mm-hmm. speaking to a person of color, like you can honestly see it. Like, you know, Hey, look, <laughs> I know it's a little uncomfortable for you. I'm going to be, you know, it's not going to be that bad. I'm telling you, just be easy, you know, and the mm. the relatability aspect. And they try to tell me something that I'm like, that has nothing to do with, you know, you know, yeah. it, it's, it's funny. Like, they'll be like, well, I went to college with this black guy one time. I'm like, whoa, that's great for you. But, you know, what for you, what has been, because like, I, I don't live over there, right? Like, I don't, I don't really know. I'm going to be honest with you, as an American, and I'll say this. There is a lot of ignorance, not because Americans are, Mm -hmm. but because I think we're taught American exceptionalism is the gold standard. And therefore, it kind of demeans the value of of other countries and their landscape and how they affect uh, just the world and its history. Right. So, like, you get taught American history as like, you know. Uh, the ultimate standard of everything and then everything else kind of falls down so um, you know even with our partners over across the pond in the UK you know what we're taught is well we got the American Revolution we broke free from you know King Henry you know what I'm saying like you know like and then they have a you know they just you know uh, unfortunately lost their queen and you know like we don't really know I mean outside of like what we see on Netflix you know we really don't know What's up? I'm super pumped. Just got done with another workout. It's your boy, CMK33, connect me on Instagram. And on the business page of CMK underscore global, you know how I get through it. You know how I get that pump look. 
<laughs> Best pre-workout on the market, www.seasonkglobal.store. So tell me about that experience. So in the UK, like we are, we're pretty diverse. You've got to, everyone's different, everyone's different backgrounds. I think now tech is getting more, they're accepting um, more people who, you know, don't necessarily have a university degree. They weren't um, born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They're mm -hmm. hardworking grafters and leadership are starting to recognize that that's enough. So where it was five, 10 years ago, slightly difficult, like people of color or people from different backgrounds, it was slightly more difficult to break into tech. But because of the, the you know, the people brave enough, I'd say, to bring this to light and shed light on the, the situation that does happen. And it still does happen. Like, I personally haven't experienced, like, too much ignorance or if I'm a women, woman or woman of color or yeah. I'm young, I haven't experienced too much, like, ignorance towards that or made me feel, a, like, a noticeable kind of way. Yeah. So... That's um yeah that I'm lucky to be in that position because not everyone else is in the same position. Other people can see blatant like disrespect or you know uh, even a certain like in di different countries I won't specify. But speaking to a woman isn't like they're like oh uh, is is your manager around or mm -hmm. like, they want to speak to a male. They want to speak to a white collar um up there in sales male majority of the time but as a country we are we're definitely adapting it's so much more diverse there's the companies are promoting it there's like diversity officers now who like have to ensure that there's a certain percentage of each race and each background and oh, wow. university degree non-university degree experience no experience so we're, we're definitely getting better it's not too noticeable in the workplaces these days so we're on the right track Hopefully it stays that way, if not gets better. Oh wow. I wow, that's that's crazy. So they've even made a a focus for even the combined experiences like having hey look we have the kind of standardized educational you know entry and then the non you know uh traditional entry into the workplace. That's that's amazing. Yeah. So I had this conversation. Um uh I had a guest on by the name of Scott Paulson. We talked okay. about differentiating yourself uh, because to be in sales, people buy you before they buy the product. That's just yeah. the God honest truth. It takes a lot to build a brand within a brand. You know, mm -hmm. I always say, you know, Nike, the, the only reason why the NBA is as big as what it is is because they had Michael Jordan, right? There was a brand within a brand. Nike attached itself to that brand, which made the business of basketball as a whole grow. How do you differentiate yourself? Like how, why should someone respond before we get into your methods? But how do you as a, as a brand individual, you know, say like, okay, so I'm getting this email from Shannon. I don't know who this company is. I don't know who this person is, you know, but what makes you different that your subject matter expertise is worth that 30 minute Zoom call? I try to be relatable. Like my LinkedIn is an example. Like I, I post funny memes. I post credible stuff. I, um, might post like certain techniques that I've used which works for me so with a combination of just being relatable and a normal person like I'm not this unapproachable um don't I'm not going to help you don't help me kind of person I try to be as welcoming and fluid as possible just to reflect my my normal personality I don't use crazy technical words and emails I say cheers at the end like my LinkedIn and um, my socials are all connected to my emails. So you can check me out. You can see I'm a, I'm a real person. I post videos. I post every day. So being that social seller and relatable person in sales is how I try to, kind of, well, where my majority of my success comes from is social selling. So being a, yeah, be a normal person, be yourself. And that that comes across it. It's always relatable to the other person if this is an, a natural conversation. Like if I'm reading from a script or if I'm copying and pasting at 300 emails and seeing what sticks, yeah. it's unlikely. So if you just are that bit more personable and yourself, it goes a long way. I like it. I I, I totally agree. I don't like the, the script thing. I, I am a proponent of personalized communication 
Um, I, you know, you can tell when somebody I like I get calls, you know. It's so funny. This guy tried to sell to me. He's like, hey, uh, Cody, can I have 27 seconds of your time? I'm like, mm. the only reason I went through it because I've been on the receiving end and I'm like, you know what? Karma yeah. is real. You know, the, the answer is no, but I'll, I'll sit through this. Thing, <laughs> right? So, you know, just because I don't want that to happen to me. Right. But mm. you're right. So talk about methodology, because some people will push back, Shannon, and, and, and God, I'm sure they'll be like, you don't know what you're talking about. Sending 5,000 emails a day you know, copying and pasting, just mm-hmm. names, cold calling 300 people a day, script work, hit the phones <laughs> heavy, you know, always be closing. This is true and blue. What do you say to that person? Um, it's an old method. It's an ancient method, which it might work for certain industries. I haven't found much success. Um, kind of just throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. I am very specific with my outbounding and who I approach. I like people with who speak on LinkedIn. They've got a detailed uh, kind of summary of what they do and what their role is. And I look and I keep an eye on their posts, what they're interacting with. And that will give me something to leverage when reaching out to them. Of course, not all the time will I get a response on the first go. Like, let's say 30% of my meetings come from persistence. Like, people appreciate persistence. And as long as it's not just, hey, did you see my email? I'm just checking in, wondering if you read, like, that's not persistence. If I'm like over a six week period and my third outreach is loved that LinkedIn post that you interacted with, I actually feel the exact same. Here's something else I thought you may like. A lot of the time when asking for a meeting, you kind of want to give, give something. And then five times out of 10, you'll get something in return or they will bite. And even if it's a no, they'll give you feedback. They'll say, look, circle back next year. Great outbounding. Like, you got my attention. Well done. And then I know, okay, cool. That's something I'm going to use going forward. If you do a video, be very specific. Make it quick and snappy, but direct and with an outcome, potential CTA at the end. Um, Social selling, personalized emails. They're my my go-to, but doing that on a sequent sequented basis is that a word <laughs> but like a, a throughout a sequence basically yeah. have you received um i i totally i agree i i think the nuance and the the creativity and the personalized approach is going to go a lot further than just throwing randomness right and seeing if it sticks um but you you mentioned it depends on the industry you know, mm-hmm. because you get in certain industries, certain companies, and they say, okay, Shannon, that's great. You know, yeah. you're, okay. you're, you're the cool new person, right? But um, we have a goal of $50 million, $100 million, mm-hmm. um, and we need more, right? And I always feel like when there's pressure to expand, the default button gets switched on, mm-hmm. right? So how do you deal with leadership that is saying, you know, I need you to tackle this workbook of a thousand accounts because there's no way you can be that personalized with a thousand. I mean, what, what you're talking about, even if you have the greatest technology in the world that kind of outlays the sequences and, you know, you can, you know, yeah. I, I understand. I know the, the tools out there. It's it's still a very precise process and there's still kind of this manual because when you do personalization, you have to figure out what goes in what needs to be shared, what doesn't need to be shared. And that's time consuming. There's no way you can cover a thousand contacts in a week. Uh, so how, how, do you, how do you convey the message to leadership? So in my leadership or who I'm prospecting? Your leadership or just in general? Yeah, so internally, we, we don't do things that um, isn't scalable. So we wouldn't go after a thousand accounts unless it's over a, a series of time. And then I would just manage my time correctly and I'd go through them. I'd add them all on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. Those who buy, they're my, they're my first, um, or those who accept me, those who connect and interact with my content. Those are my first go-tos. So I always segment it to, you know, who's, who's responding just to my requests. And then I'll go and see who has the most to leverage. Like, do they, do they post much on LinkedIn? Do they mention like what their company's after? Do Am I familiar with their company? Those are kind of my priority, um, my prioritized accounts. And then the lower hanging fruit, which, you know, there's not, I don't know an awful lot about the industry or I don't know enough about the person to even make something personalized. 
those ones, you can send a generic email, like slightly less generic where they like, they don't know that this has just been sent to a thousand people, but generic enough that it's scalable. So there's loads of tech these days, though, that you can incorporate into your, your workflow that will allow you to reach that many people. You always feel, um, filter that down anyway. You'll get bounces from email addresses, company, people no longer work in companies. So you can, you'll be left with a decent amount, which then you'll prioritize accordingly. My message to management is if you're going to give an SDR, BDR, a thousand counts and say, go for it, you need a bit more of a, a process to for them to tackle those accounts. And you can't expect decent um, decent work to be produced or decent messaging to go across to them if that's the scale you want them to uh, to target. Hmm. Hmm. I, I like it. I like it. You can't expect quality with that type of mass and, and what I would call undefined mass, right? Like there's yeah. no real thought process. It's just these are potential players in this space. Uh, nothing's been verified. Nothing's been researched. Let's go mm-hmm. get a tiger, right? Kind of just doesn't work. Um, um, so, out. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. So mm-hmm. let's, um, I know we run out of time. I got about a couple more questions. Right. Um, talk to us, you know, how does a, how do you become great at this? What is your, what is your strategy? I mean, you mentioned it, you talked about social selling, but really dig into the weeds. Like, you know, we want to know, you know, Shannon's secret sauce, you know, like when you open up your laptop, mm-hmm. it's uh, whatever, if, you know, whatever you're doing early in the morning, you got your career brewing, you got your coffee, right. Um, you know, I've recently switched to tea. I've become like this tea person. I don't know what's going on. This is a sign of age, uh, oh but <laughs> you know, <laughs> You're 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 in the you're in the mode and you're like, okay, I gotta do this. How do you do what you do? How I do, I think first and foremost, you need to set yourself a goal for the week. So if I want to book six or seven meetings by Friday, or I want an easy Friday, so by Thursday, I need to do seven meetings. What's going to get me to that? So I would go through like a nurture pot, people who I've been speaking to on an ongoing basis you will always be able to get something. If you've been interacting with someone, like most likely those people um, will, of course, if they're interested in your product, will will accept the meeting. They'll go ahead. They'll go to the next stage. Me in general, I'd say after planning my day, planning my week, I start my research. I, I do a bit of reading. You do reading of the industry, just kind of getting your brain and your mind in the right mindset to go and speak and have these kind of, like if you, you're speaking to smart people. You need to have these uh, quite intuitive conversations. So doing a bit of light reading is always good. Keeping your, um, just keeping updated with the industry, watching podcasts and reading blogs. Those are all good things to get your week started. And then when it comes to your secret source is like, like we mentioned, you don't want to go too big. You want 50 people, specific people who you've done your research on, and you're targeting them. If you say in your head, like, this isn't cold, this is a very warm lead to me because I've done my research, I know what they want, I'm reading what they want, I can see their company's, um, their company numbers and their company goal is to expand their B2B business this year and I can help them. Therefore, alter everything to be specific to that um, prospect. So I find myself most successful when... I have the the information and I just word that correctly. These people get hundreds of emails um, or thousands a week. I don't know how many, but being able to cut through and clickbait, put something in subject line. I throw loads of different things to see what works. And then I run with a successful subject line. As long as I'm getting through to them, that's the first step is whether they then read it, invest in tech, which can highlight whether they've opened something and then you know if they if they've gone back to it like I've had funny emails like I'll write a, I'll write a poem I'll do a playlist I'll do some funky things it's got the wordings there but they're like they appreciate the creativity that you've gone through and they're like hey this this girl sounds fun what, what are you even talking about I want to hear more and they tend to give you time based on like creativity persistence and that is where like our, even my team as well, my team's super good. We all have our different little ways of prospecting and 
we're all successful in the creativity side. So your secret sauce should be something you're good at, it's scalable, and it's funny. It brings some humor, it brings some smiles to the to the email. I feel like trash, man. I was listening, I was like, what? I was like, you like a playlist. I thought I was gonna create I'm like a playlist. I feel yeah, so with trash you. right now. I'm like, man. <laughs> I need to step my game up. You know, like I you know, I, I like to think that I'm actually pretty decent at this, but I wow. Um that is an eye opener. I I the due diligence that you give to each company mm-hmm. and each person um is special and almost almost I don't want to say I don't know if foreign is the right word, but it's almost it's it's <laughs> yeah, it's different. It's different because I know transparent moment, right? Yeah, I, I um I still do. I think I'm pretty personal. I, I really try not to be random. I try not to rely on you know company email mm-hmm. templates and I don't ever use a script and I'm sorry if my boss is listening. Yeah, you know, I, I'll be hundred percent. I don't do it. Uh, <laughs> hey, because I've been successful without it. I don't want to be hey, you know, 20, you can say what you want. Anybody knows nobody wants to take that phone call. You know, it's just it's an mm-hmm. annoying thing. It sounds awkward, it doesn't and sound that do yeah, and it, it puts the wall up. Security, call yeah. it. Um, like you don't even need the script, and you just, you start reading it. Sound robotic, so you do. Time, you know, you kind of you can freestyle things. You know what your your value prop is. Work and around plus, it. I feel like I can gauge within five three seconds. This person's yeah. gonna listen to me. You know, I'm gonna either get cussed out or this person's like, you know what, Cody? Like once I, I've been I've been told no, but because I know how to kind of do that tango, they're like, Cody, that was good. But <laughs> the answer is still no. So I play, you know, and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with yeah. it. But it's really hard to give a contact that much energy when you know I have a million miles to travel, right? Yeah. So, and I admit, and this is Ms. speaking professionally, I think sometimes I sacrifice the quality of my message, the quality of my outreach, because the quantity is so vast. Like there's so much to do that, you know, every second of the day is segmented every minute. You know, I need to be accounted for doing this, this, this and this to the point that, you know. I, I and I'll, I'll take this to go back and say to retool, hey, look, I need to slow down. And just even if I reduce it to like 20, you know, for the week, because I have these certain goals, I think is a better is a better process. Um, I like it. I like it. Last question. And I'm done. Shane, I'll let you off the hook. I know you've given me the space. I appreciate you so much. I love it. What is right? Like you you talk about SDR work and whatnot. Um, What is the future of sales? And before you answer that, let me layer it. Mm -hmm. I've been a I've been at a few organizations. I'm gonna say many, but a few organizations, and I have not seen the perfect balance between the evolution of talent. Best way to say it. That is the best way to say it. Okay. And so, an SDR who is really amazing becomes an AE and major key. However, the company labels these you know titles that are. Uh, arbitrary. They all do the same thing. It just depends on the volume of the account that they work, right? So, um, and then they lose that creativity because now they're dealing with the pressures of the uh, BDR work, which is, you know, volume. <laughs> it's not quality. It's, it's yeah. value, right? So what what is, you know, because Scott, I'll take Scott. Scott, who I mentioned earlier, said the future of sales is mercenary work. Basically, you know, me, you will become hired guns for these organizations. We'll be assigned to projects and we'll be paid based off of the project, you know, acquisition, first retaining the talent, then the completion of the project. And we'll work for 10, 15 companies within a year, uh, project by project at a, you know, declared rate. So it's like an entrepreneurship, you know, on steroids, right? Uh, so... For you, Shannon, what do you see as the future of sales? So future for my personal sales, so 
I, I don't want the promotion to AE route. So I want to continue um, leading SDRs to keep being creative and keeping this creativity in, a work, um, in their workflows and processes. If I could also, you know, train AEs to, to keep that as well. And um, I, I know it's difficult when you've got a target on your back, right. but you'll be surprised how, how tangible or closer you are to that target if you keep your creativity, if you keep on top of still prospecting, still building your own pipeline, because that's still... I mean, if you don't if you don't get somewhere of uh, said prospect, like you've got ten back um, ten backlogged because you continued your prospecting, you, you held on to your creativity, you held on to what everything you learned as an SDR, you kept, and you're now the most successful in your team because you're still doing all the things that got you into that place. So, as long as the future of sales allows new routes and suggestions that open to these new ways of selling. And they're not just the typical pick up the phone, sell, 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 never stop selling. That's the only way. Don't email, just forget about it. Don't follow up, forget about it. Mm. If you're only interested in trying to book and not nurture these people, it's probably, unless you've got some amazing product where it's all inbound leads, um, which your product's probably amazing, but it's, it's very hard to get unlimited inbound leads. So as long as you keep the mentality of still being able to prospect and creatively um, prospect, you'll you'll be in the right place. Um, so yeah, the future of sales. They, I know the younger generation is creeping up, and I think they're they're holding on to this making sales fun again, or I don't know how fun it used to be, but making sales more fun and more interactive and more normal, like personable mm. and all people here was just one professional speaking with another people are busy they're they're not going to be able to take every meeting of course but right. as long as yeah company morals and values and leadership all are aligned mm-hmm. there shouldn't be a problem <laughs> that makes sense mm-hmm. Shannon, if people wanted to reach out to you say look we did what you do you know it's amazing i we, we dig the the thought leadership that you're providing how can they connect with you uh, LinkedIn is the best. I the best way. I accept everyone. Um, always up for a chat. Um, anything and if I can offer anything, I'm happy to. And yeah, I'm I'm a big networker, so I'm all into it. And networking events as well. You will most likely catch me there in London, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> Y'all yeah, connect with Shannon on LinkedIn. And if you want to keep seeing amazing talent amazing leaders amazing thought leaders you know what you got to do the best business tainment podcast out there I, I was just thinking i was like man i need to change my screen i got this new graphic flyer and everything i haven't even updated y'all you know what you got to do cv space k on youtube instagram at cvmk underscore global cvmk global tiktok www.cvmk global as you see this is a reoccurring thing dot store that's where the best stuff is and until next time guys thanks <laughs>